This meeting is now being recorded. Well, good evening. Welcome to the EDS Awareness Educational Series webinar. My name is John Furman. Before we introduce our speaker this evening, I'd like to give an overview of our free program for those attending for the first time. So we'll go over who we are, what is our program, some upcoming events, introduce our speaker for this evening, Dr. Bridgham, and then we'll have a Q&A session. So again, my name is John Furman. I manage the National EDS Awareness Program based in Cincinnati, Ohio. My daughter, Deanna, who's also on the call, leads the Cleveland, Ohio EDS Support Group. She was diagnosed with EDS in 2008, the same year my wife passed away with breast cancer. I was a caregiver for my wife who struggled with undiagnosed EDS for over 30 years. So we introduced our program at the 2012 EDNF conference to help EDSers form independent local support groups and spread EDS awareness in their communities. We've started or helped to start over 90 groups to date. Each group is given their own free website with a link from the directory map. We receive feedback that conferences provide valuable information and social opportunities that many cannot afford physically or financially to attend in person. So we decided to bring the speakers to you through the free EDS Awareness Educational Series. We meet every first and third Tuesday, typically at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. All of the programs are free. The meeting announcements and whenever possible, the recordings will be posted on our website at edsawareness.com for later replay. You can receive email announcements for future sessions by requesting the free report on our site. Tonight's presentation is sponsored by Body Support Store where you'll find over 250 products selected by EDSers for EDSers. The store is the only funding for this program, and it usually covers our monthly web fees. So please visit our store and check out the helpful products that we sell. Just a general disclaimer, this presentation contains general information about EDS, Members of the EDS community voluntarily participate in this program. The information is not advice. If you're having medical problems right now, please call 911 and get the services that you need. Always consult your doctor before making any changes in your treatment. Wanted to let you know about some upcoming webinars we have in our schedule. Our December presenters include Kelly Clancy, who is an occupational therapist, talking about manual therapy approaches for EDS on December 1st. Also, we will have Dr. Petra Klinga, who is a neurosurgeon, talk about tethered cord syndrome on December 15th. She was also a speaker at the uh, most recent EVNF conference. And here are our upcoming speakers for 2016. Please see our webinar page on our website for the full and ongoing schedule. For those attending live tonight, there will be an opportunity for Q&A after the presentation. Add your questions at any time by clicking the Q&A icon at the top of your screen. After typing your question, click the orange button to submit. Tonight's speaker is Dr. Clive Bridgham. His topic will be chronic pain alternatives, which will also address inflammation, nutrition, and more. Dr. Bridgham is the owner of Barrington Chiropractic Clinic and the past president of the Chiropractic Society of Rhode Island and a current board member of CSRI. He is the only board certified chiropractic sports medicine specialist in Rhode Island he provides hands-on extensive muscle testing evaluations, kinesio taping, therapeutic exercise, 
nutritional co consultations, as well as chiropractic techniques. He brings over 25 years of national and international experience at, at events such as the X Games, World Games, and the Salt Lake City Winter Olympics. He treats not only athletes, but pain patients of all ages and pain issues. Well, welcome, Dr. Bridgen. We're looking forward to your presentation, and we're going to load your slides now. And go ahead and turn over the microphone to you. It's our pleasure to have you tonight. Uh, thank you very much, Deanna and John, for the opportunity to speak this evening, and also to Ellen Smith from Rhode Island, who I think put us all together. So yes. Tonight, we'll be covering a wide variety of topics on chronic pain, nutritional, and other causes. So if it feels like we're jumping around a little bit, indeed we are. And uh, let's move ahead. I also have a disclaimer. I'm a licensed healthcare practitioner. I'm a chiropractic physician. I graduated from National University of Health Sciences in Chicago in 1986 and have been in private practice in Barrington, Rhode Island. 1987, and then had the good fortune of being able to do a lot of international chiropractic work at, at sports medicine events. The concepts of chronic pain have, have always been of interest to me, and I hope tonight's information will be helpful. Uh, I've had extensive training, obviously, in health and disease. Uh, if you have any information that you're gaining during this webinar event, you agree to take full responsibility for any health care decisions you make because of it. I'm making every effort possible to present current information about inflammation, chronic pain. The information presented this evening is not intended to diagnose, treat, or cure any medical condition. This is not a medical advisory event, but a public where, a webinar awareness education event. So please contact your physician of choice for specific medical advice. And thank you all for attending all over the world. I guess that's for the lawyers, which we need the disclaimer. So, Let's first of all look at what is pain. Um, it's a distressing sensation, as we know. It's complex. It's subjective. You're the one who is feeling the pain. And it's difficult to develop an adequate definition, but one that we use is pain is an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage and are described in terms of such damage. So what does pain do? It motivates us to withdraw from the damaging situation, protect a damaged body part while it heals, and to avoid similar experiences in the future. Most pain resolves once the painful stimulus is removed and the body is healed, but it may persist despite removal of the stimulus and the apparent healing of the body. Sometimes pain arises in the absence of any detectable stimulus to damage or disease. As we know, pain is the most common reason that we would consult a physician because it does interfere with the quality of life in our general. So, what's one way we can deal with pain? Well, we can deal it with it with a pill. Uh, right now, especially in Rhode Island and in the United States, we're facing a difficult dilemma that so many people have been prescribed opioid pillars. Uh, that they're now addicted and it's causing a lot of death. The primary tool of a primary care medical physician for pain would be prescription pharmaceuticals, whether they be the NSAIDs and non-steroidals, and we'll talk about those, or opioid pain. They're responsible uh, in general for 28% of opioid prescription, internist next, or orthopedic surgeons next. And why I have this slide in here is because as a chiropractic physician in Rhode Island, I am entitled to all the rights and privileges of any physician, with the exception of pharmaceutical prescription major surgery. So I have to use other tools to help my patients with chronic pain. I do a proper history and a differential diagnosis, treat and or refer patients to pain. I'm entitled to do any laboratory testing, blood and urine imaging as well. So, oh, what could be a cause of pain that we may not normally think about? Uh, I don't know how many of you are taking a statin drug for cholesterol. Well, there are complications and benefits involved with statin drugs. The basic guidelines include 
almost everybody in the United States if you're from 40 to 75 years old and have a 7.5% or higher risk for having a heart attack or stroke within 10 years, you're supposed to be on a statin drug. Well, uh, in the United States, if we have a, a lipid cholesterol analysis, uh, we end up with a ratio and tell us at what percentage uh, we, we lie in. Uh, anybody who's had a cardiovascular event should have a stroke, uh, should have theoretically be on a statin drug. Um, people 21 and older who have a very high level of the LDL cholesterol of 190 or above, it's recommended. And anyone with type 1 or type 2 at who diabetes who are 40 to 75 years old. So that, that's a huge net of people. The, one of the interesting complications of a statin drug is that it may cause diabetes. So by some estimates, what we call a statin myopathy may affect 7 million of the 33 million people in the United States taking statins for cholesterol. That's, that's 25%. So what is a statin myopathy? Basically, it's muscle ache, weakness, and it's recommended, uh, you've seen the TV commercials over here, call your doctor right away if it be signs of a dangerous breakdown of muscle tissue. So a little more specifically, there, there's not a great consensus of what a statin-induced myopathy is. I've seen many patients over the years uh, with a statin myopathy. Uh, individual biochemistry can respond uh, differently to statins and may cause some problems, but obviously, if you're suspecting uh, if you're on a statin drug and you're having these, these aches and pains and this chronic pain, you need to talk with your physician, and there are a number of options available. You could have a statin holiday, take some time off or greatly reduce your dosage or change to a different statin drug. What's interesting, it says in the slide here, resin therapy. Uh, it's interesting, most of us don't know that the origins of the statin drugs came from what's called a red rice which is available, and people can take it. And if I have a patient who's coming to me saying they've been recommended to take a statin, I say, well, let's try the red yeast rice. But the big caveat, caution here, is that all red yeast rice is not the same. The big box stores in this country, uh, a lot of the drug stores that sell this, it's just not quality. Works. So what are some other adverse effects while we're on the statin topic? Well, cognitive impairment, memory loss, forgetfulness, amnesia, memory impairment, and confusion. What does that sound like? To me, it sounds like the epidemic of Alzheimer's that we're having in this country. And there are some very good studies that are saying that statin drugs are a major contributing factor to the Alzheimer's epidemic in this country. So if you're on a statin drug, you need to look at your risk to see if you really need the statin drug and talk with your physician about the possibility of, of toxic problems with it. And as I said here, it also raises your, your blood sugar levels, which of course would be the development of type 2 diabetes. So kind of who's at risk at this point? Uh, well, in a one case study of 354 patients, ages 34 to 86, they self-reported muscle-related problems associated with statin therapy. 93% of these people reported muscle pain, 88% fatigue, and 85% so it, it's possible that if you have these problems both at rest or with exercise and you're on a statin drug, you want to look at it. It seems that it's common for women taking statins that they are tired, exercise, emotional fatigue, and general loss of, loss of uh, uh, one moment. And is my voice volume any better now? Uh, there's apparently a problem with audio. Yes, it's wonderful. Very okay. good. It's better now. Yes. All right, good. I, I just switched over. So um, this is some research that uh, chiropractic physician Dr. Warren Hammer uh, developed, and he has a, a lot of his pain, patients who are on statin drugs do develop the muscle pain, tenderness, weakness, peripheral neuropathy, which is nerve pain, tendinopathy, and lupus-like symptoms, which seem to be contributing uh, to their, by their use of statin drugs. So that, that's just one side of it. Now we're going to make a, another big jump. So 
what causes inflammation in, in our bodies? Uh, it's not just musculoskeletal pain. It's not just from physical trauma or infection. Our body is designed wonderfully to create inflammatory chemicals when we need them. If we're injured to prevent infection, if we are infected, if we have a, a significant bacterial or viral illness, inflammation is there to take care of that problem. But it's not just those kinds of things which can cause inflammation in our body. Inadequate sleep uh, is a stress to our homeostatic basis. Homeostasis is just the balance that our body is always working towards creating. Inadequate relief, uh, sleep can lead to the inflammatory chemicals uh, that contribute to inflammation. Stress is another big one. How many of us are not stressed these days? And if you're suffering with EDS, I'm sure that adds to the stress. So inadequate sleep, stress, all put our bodies into a pro-inflammatory state. So how can we decrease stress, um, act physical activity if possible, meditation? Uh, however you find um, ways of doing that are excellent. And then it's recommended that your sleep goal should be between at least six and nine hours in a 24-hour sleep cycle. Also, um, we are what we eat and we are what we sleep. So both of these areas we'll be exploring tonight. When possible, uh, to decrease stress on our bodies, I like to say there are three S's in posture. Sit tall, stand tall, and stay tall. And obviously with the EDS, that may be difficult. So what can I do dietarily uh, to decrease some of the inflammation? Well, what happens when we're stressed? We generally don't reach for broccoli and cauliflower. Those are not our comfort foods, especially in the United States. So our average American diet, however, isn't just uh, comfort food for when we want comfort food, but it's chronic comfort food. Uh, most Americans, our diet is uh, uh, no more than 10% of our calories are coming from vegetables and fruits, which we'll find shortly are, are very important to decrease inflammation. So in addition, uh, the lack of sleep and stress all create imbalances in our homeostasis in our balance situation and all contribute to systemic inflammation. And then also, sleep, uh, lack of sleep and stress promote the consumption of our comfort foods. So it's not surprising that 60% um, of the average diet in the United States come from sugar, flour, and refined oils. So these refined oils can include corn, safflower, sunflower, cottonseed, and soybean. And the problem there is that they all contain an excessive amount of a certain essential fatty acid called linoleic acid, which is an omega-6 fatty acid. And the body then takes this and converts it into arachidonic acid, which is one of the most highly inflammatory substances our body can make. Now, our body in its infinite wisdom has given us a mechanism to deal with this arachidonic acid cascade because the arachidonic acid then creates prostaglandin 2. And we'll see in the next slide about that. But basically our body in its innate wisdom has also given us prostaglandin 1 and 3, which counter the effects of the inflammatory prostaglandin 2. So in terms of our diet, if you're on soy products, uh, soybeans, uh, as well as all these other oils, and including uh, most grains and legumes and peanuts, those all feed our arachidonic acid cascade, putting us into a pro-inflammatory state. The other 15 to 20 percent of our calories generally in the United States come from overfat animal products, 10 percent from dairy, and these all contain preformed arachidonic acid, again, a very highly inflammatory substance in our body. So this issue of dietary arachidonic acid is important to understand. The arachidonic acid that we eat is converted by the body into the prostaglandin 2, which I said, which causes pain and inflammation. In other words, we literally eat pain and inflammation for breakfast, lunch, dinner, and snacks. Years ago, uh, ice cream was a special treat. You would maybe get it once in the summer at a church picnic. I'm talking 100 years ago where children would be churning the urn to make ice cream. Now we open up our refrigerator and have our chunky monkeys and our pizzas and all of the foods that are convenient and have been manufactured to taste really good and become addictive. They get the perfect balance of sweet, sugar, and salt, uh, and we have our carbo addicts. Uh, 
most of us have no idea that we overeat pain and inflammation every day in the form of the arachidonic acid. Uh, what do we do about it? Well, the medical community has given us wonderful tools. Those are pills, NSAIDs, all the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, the aspirins, the tinolols, the ibuprofens, uh, that we, many people take it every day just to function. They wake up in the morning, cup of coffee, and a couple of ibuprofens um, to deal with the dietary arachidonic acid, which is causing all their pain and inflammation. I think it might be a much better idea to consider stopping the intake of these foods. Also, how about osteoarthritis, uh, all that pain in the joints that we have? Is that a nat natural consequence of aging that leads to these, uh, to, to the use of the medications? Um, yes, when we have the osteoarthritis, we want to take the pills to feel better. But is it a natural consequence of aging? Studies back as early as 1975 has demonstrated, no, it's not a natural manifesta manifestation of aging. It is directly related to the arachidonic acid level uh, in joint tissue uh, as we age. So it's, it's not the wear and tear necessarily on the joints. It's the presence of highly inflammatory compounds which lead to the degenerative uh, joint disease anywhere in our body. However, this arachidonic acid, this insidious little inflammatory chemical, is not unique to joint tissue. It can be all over our body. For instance, effects on our brain. The so brain tissue levels of arachidonic acid in patients with gliomas and meningiomas, which are cancers in the brain, are elevated compared with normal subjects. So in other words, on a microscopic level throughout our body, our body transforms into an inflammatory state due to the daily consumption of inflammatory foods. This microscopic dietary injury leads to the use of many, many medications. So we shouldn't make the error in assuming that it's just years of improper eating that have caused it. If you know, we, we certainly don't eat like our grandparents or great-grandparents. Since World War II, the uh, changes in the food supply, especially in this country, are enormous. Things that were special treats are just every day. Even we take our basic grains, our wheat. In the 1970s, there was a great concern that we needed to have a much better wheat to be able to feed the burgeoning population on Earth. So at Harvard University, uh, I believe a geneticist or a biochemist were working and they created a whole new version of wheat that will grow in very arid climates and have much more protein value to it. Well, unfortunately, this changed the whole structure of the grain. And when I was a child growing up, we didn't have uh, all these issues uh, with grain and uh, allergies to wheat and gluten sensitivities. Um, it's quite possible that our bodies just cannot handle all of these new foods. If you think about it, basically we've been about the same kind of body for several thousand years. The changes that our body has made to try to adapt to all these new foods and chemicals that we are taking in and that are in our environment, it just it cannot happen. Our, our, our bodies are factories and just can't process it. So what can be the result of, of some of these things? As we said, we're looking at the arachidonic acid cascade pathway. So what we do know is a pro-inflammatory pro diet consumed by most Americans leads to an immediate post prandial surge in blood sugar, free fatty acids, and triglycerides. Uh, meaning right after a meal, a, a, a typical American meal, we have all of these changes biochemically which are not good for it. The hyperglycemia, the increased sugar in our blood, uh, in particular overwhelms mitochondria. Those are, the, those are in our cells, and they're the little energy producers. And it causes the mitochondria to ex generate excess free radicals, which again cause inflammation. And this induces systemic inflammation and endothelial dysfunction. Uh, part of EDS is that it can affect uh, the connective tissue wherever, and in the lining of the blood vessels, it causes a problem. That's the endothelial tissue. So would you want your house on fire and then add more flames to it? So if you already have a, a, a genetic tendency towards uh, endothelial dysfunction, uh, would you want to then fire that up in even more. The image I like to use is a, like a gas stove. You turn it up really hot, the flames are, are, are 
roaring and everything gets burned. That's the inflammation. That's that bonfire going on. Eating can cause that bonfire in our arteries. When they get inflamed with irritating chemicals, uh, whether it be tobacco, smoke, or other food products, and then what they do is they split and crack, and that's the connective tissue that's trying to hold them. So I would certainly recommend that you consider dietarily a way of eating that might help you. So they did some test meals to see what would drive that process of, uh, and a typical breakfast, say three slices of buttered white toast, 900 calories, or a typical McDonald's breakfast that consists of an Egg McMuffin, sausage McMuffin, two hash browns, etc. Not only are the calories really high, but it just drives that inflammatory postprandial state. In other words, people live in an acute diet-induced inflammatory state, acute meaning instant, while they develop the chronic diet-induced inflammatory state. So we're just doing this dietary march toward chronic pain and disease, and we don't even know we're doing it. What do we see on television advertised for breakfast? All the cereals, all the grains. We'll get to some more specifics uh, in a few more slides. So from uh, the perspective of overall health, wellness, and longevity, uh, we should really endeavor to eat the anti-inflammatory diet to prevent chronic, chronic disease. So what is a deflame, turning down that gas burner flame approach to eating? Basically, it's the Mediterranean diet, which hopefully most of you know about it. Uh, it's not a high-fat diet, not like an Atkins-style diet, but instead it's a diet that focuses on olive oil, moderate red wine if you're of age, green vegetables, salads, fish as a primary protein, as well as lean meat, fowl, eggs, shellfish, and cheese. Fish we do need to be concerned about these days. If nothing else, the um, power plant in Japan, um, when it dumped all the radioactivity into the oceans, that's affecting fish. We know large fish, uh, especially in the fatty fish, develop uh, heavy concentrations of heavy metal toxicity, which are burdens that we don't want. So it's difficult. Certainly lean protein, I would say, versus just fish and vegetation and salads are a good focus. So what's conspicuously absent from a Mediterranean diet? Well, refri refined grains, whole grains and legumes, all the beans, peanuts, those are all legumes. Those are overtly inflammatory, uh, as is the case with all of the refined carbohydrates, the desserts, the breads, uh, the even pasta, uh, pies, and ice creams, all of these refined, high-sugary uh, foods uh, are pro-inflammatory. So what do we need to focus on? Certainly vegetables and fruit. Fruit, once again, uh, can cause hyperglycemia, especially like, say, an American breakfast that you think might be good would be bananas, orange juice, and a bagel. Well, there's enough uh, sugars in there, especially just one banana. That's a completely over-recommended fruit. Bananas should be used once in a while if you like. So the, the fruit smoothie, which is low in fat, is not necessarily the best breakfast. You're just starting the pro-inflammatory cascade going on, as in the case for grains and legumes. Um, so as the anti-inflammatory diet excludes gluten, we may be able to take care of anybody with a gluten sensitivity problem. Uh, wheat, rye, and barley all are uh, glutens and all can host inflammatory conditions. So if people have uh, asthma, uh, even schizophrenia now most recently has been looked at as an inflammatory disease in the brain. There are markers there, uh, autoimmune diseases and even cancers. So it's, it's worthwhile uh, doing some research. There's a wonderful book called Wheat Belly. It's uh, just like a beer belly, but it's Wheat Belly, and it talks about the history of grains and wheat and how they have changed radically since the 1970s in this country. This is a, a, a slide that comes out of my chiropractic background. So thinking out of the box, which hopefully we'll get some of you to do tonight and kind of ask some questions and think a bit differently about where your chronic pain may be coming from. How about infection for low back pain? Um, in school, we learned that if there was an infection going on in the spine and the vertebrae, that this was very rare and we would never 
ever see them. Well, indeed, uh, in my 30-odd years of practice, I, I've seen one that was definitely uh, created by an infection in the spine, and it might have been related to dental work uh, a year previous. We don't quite know. What happens is, on MRIs now, if you've ever had one done, they might list modic type 1 changes, which are degenerative changes in the disc we can see the actual changes in the vertebrae as well as in the disc. They're due to degeneration and inflammation. That, we used to think, was just caused by, oh, overuse or obesity or, you know, being out of shape. But now we're finding that infection in those tissues is much more common than what we thought. Uh, must we change our perspective? This is, this is some new evidence. So I think we constantly need to look at the relationships differently than what we have been taught in the past about inflammation and disease. So we're taught that, you know, infection, malignancy, big red flags would hardly ever see one. And indeed, as I said, I've only seen one. But a study that was done uh, looking at people, 247 people, where they actually took out nuclear, meaning disc material, from the spine of these people. They had disc herniations, scoliosis, fracture, tumors, etc. Bacteria was present in 37% of those cases. That's, that's kind of revolutionary for us, thinking that back pain can be caused by bacteria. Guess what the bacteria is that causes this? Okay. Cheryl Hawk, uh, excuse me a second, I think I went one too far. Yes, okay, guess what the bacteria is? It's right there, T. acne. Most of us know that as, as adolescents when we had acne uh, on our faces. That's the organism that causes it. Also, it seems that uh, with chronic low back pain, uh, with people in this study, uh, that all of the disc cases had T. acnes in there. So a bacteria somehow migrates. What's unique about this and why I bring it up is not that it's going to be something that's going to necessarily affect you, but what jumps out, this is according to Cheryl Hawk, who's the Dean of Research at Logan College of Chiropractic, set of the study that found the P. acnes in the back pain patients. It demonstrates what, we, what we're thinking too narrowly when we call something musculoskeletal. So EDS is obviously a musculoskeletal disease, a connective tissue disease, but nothing is only musculoskeletal or only psychological or only gastrointestinal or only neurological or only biochemical. Science and physicians are learning, and we are all learning that everything in the body and outside the body, for that matter, is integrated and interactive. So it's apparent that the immune system, diet, lifestyle contribute to low back pain in ways we had no idea before. Uh, the data has major implications also for importing the, uh, for a positive approach to anti-inflammatory diet and for supporting one's immune system and more. So what can I do besides be on a Mediterranean diet? Are there some nutritional supplements that I should consider? A uh, lot of talk over the last few years about vitamin D3. We just started testing for vitamin D3, oh, probably about five years ago. And everyone in my practice uh, that I test for vitamin D levels in the blood, they're all significantly low. Our body has receptors everywhere for vitamin D, brain, immune, spine. Yes, even in the spine there are receptors, and they work as vitamin D3 works as an anti-inflammatory in the spine. So, how do you know if you need vitamin D? Well, basically it's the sunshine vitamin. If you're in the sun in a pair of shorts or a small bathing suit 20 minutes a day without any sunscreen on, 10 minutes per side, you're probably getting sufficient vitamin D. Well, what about skin cancers? Yes, I said 20 minutes, and I certainly not at high noon, and maybe not start with 20 minutes. But if you have that amount of exposure, then... Um, you're fine, but having just your face and your arms exposed, that would not be enough. So a blood test can help us evaluate the need. Vitamin D3 uh, in the blood is uh, on a scale from 32 to 100 is considered normal. So where should I be if I have that blood test done? Make sure you ask your doctor for your number because a lot of people, if they have a vitamin D3 blood test, um, the doc will say, oh, you're fine, and maybe you're at 38 or 35. Well, if you think about 
school days, back when you were in school, and or if you're still in school, uh, if you look at a grade scale from 33 to 100, where do you think you want to be? Certainly, 50 to 60 is just passing, but for the purposes of this webinar, you know, I'll say that that's where you certainly want to be. And you can generally get there if you take 5,000 units a day. Uh, the, uh, there's a great resource on the web, uh, the Vitamin D Council, which will give you a lot more information on vitamin D. But it does function as an anti-inflammatory. How about these fish oils that we're talking about? Um, eating fish is very good, but we have to be concerned about toxicity in the fish, as we do in the fish oil. And these are the essential fatty acids. Fish oils work wonderfully as an anti-inflammatory. Uh, probably not as well as prescription strength ibuprofen, but for long term, they could be very helpful. So how do we know if we need fish oils and what should we get? Well, there is also a blood test for this. You could ask your physician for an essential fatty acid EFA test. And uh, what you need to do once that information is there, it'll be a whole bunch of numbers. What you really want to look for is, and unfortunately I don't have a slide for this, but this ratio of 5 to 1 is the omega-6 versus the omega-3 oil. So omega-6, ideal 5 to 1 ratio, and you can add up the numbers on a blood test and figure that out. The, that's the ideal. Very few people are there. People are, can be 60 to 1. It's, it's quite frightening, again, because of the American diet that we eat. We eat ourselves in it. inflammation and our balance of essential fatty acids is way out of balance. So, Good oil to have would be olive oil and then the fish oil. The source of the fish oils, again, the big box stores are not necessarily the best place to go for that. Vitamin D, absolutely, wherever you want to get it, internet, big box stores, uh, pharmacies, that's great. For fish oils, you need a good quality. Um, Nordic Naturals, I have no relationship with them uh, at all. Uh, that's a place to start and look at. They are more expensive, but they're... Uh, micro distilled and should be a much safer source. How much do I need? Well, certainly start with combined EPA DHA of one to three grams per day. You may get a burpy taste. Uh, I take mine at night, so if I do taste the fishy taste, uh, I don't notice it because I'm asleep. Okay, changing gears. What else can cause inflammation? Uh, I was just at a wonderful symposium, the National. Uh, Lyme Association had a seminar. It happened to be in Rhode Island where I practiced this weekend. Some of the top thinkers and scientists presented elegant papers. Why I bring up Lyme disease here is, one, it's an, uh, once again a uh, very little uh, diagnosed cause of chronic pain. Yet uh, it is much more common than what we have had in the past. This is due to a number of environmental factors where population of the animals carrying the ticks uh, have increased and the fleas that, uh, give it to the animals, the, the ticks get it and then the ticks bite us. The, the whole uh, ecology is changing everywhere in the world, the deforestation, uh, the loss of things like foxes uh, that would prey on these and other small mammals that would eat, eat the white-footed mice which carry the fleas which start that whole cycle going. So it's the whole ecolo ecological change which contributing to this. But Lyme disease, as we know, is an infectious disease caused by a bacteria of the Borrelia type. It's from a tick. Uh, quite often, if you get bitten by the tick and they have enough time on you to give you the bacteria, the spirochete, you will get a red rash known as a target rash, which is the uh, erythema migrans. It starts at the site of the tick and expands out, and it's like a red target, like you shoot a bow and arrow at. It's neither itchy nor painful and at least 25% of people or more don't develop the rash. So what other cues do you have if you don't develop the rash? This disease is most prevalent in the summer. It's uh, very large in the northeastern part of the United States. Uh, Rhode Island, I think we have a minimum of 55 infected per 100,000 people here. Uh, other states, Maine, I think is at the top of the list, but these figures are all uh, not up to date anymore. So early symptoms could be to be just like the flu. So in the summer, if you uh, start to develop flu-like symptoms, fever, headachey, feeling tired, those, and you got a summer flu and nobody else is getting them. Um, let's see, a 
apparently we're still having a little trouble with sound. Um, uh, is this any better here? Uh, if I, I moved it a bit further away, or now it's moving closer? Does this? I think it sounds better. Sounds better closer. I think um, the sound is is pretty good. Okay. All right. Great. Uh, I will keep it quite close then. The uh, other symptoms of of the Lyme disease could be loss of ability to move on one or both sides of the face, uh, just like you're having a stroke, uh, joint pains, or severe headaches with neck stiffness and or heart palpitations because this Borrelia can go wherever it likes. Uh, occasionally people develop uh, swelling in the knees, uh, shooting pain uh, into the arms and legs, and then it can go into the brain neuroborreliosis. So I'm not trying to scare you here, but it's just something to be aware of uh, if you all of a sudden get a summer flu and don't quite understand why. Uh, so the flu-like symptoms, the headache, muscle soreness, fever, and just an overall feeling of malaise. If it's not treated early, uh, it can go into a um, dormant for a, a year or years, and then you get migrating pain in muscles, joints, tendons. Fibromyalgia quite often uh, is a diagnosis we hear, and Lyme disease may be underlying it. Uh, and then the neuroborreliosis, when it goes into the central nervous system, that's that facial palsy I was mentioning about, but it can cause the neck stiffness, sensitivity to light, and meningitis if it attacks the brain and spinal cord or meninges. Uh, so that's the encephalitis, and it can cause uh, major psychological problems even in children with memory loss, sleep disturbances, uh, ADD, um, uh, bursts of anger, uh, just and, and changes in personality. Uh, I even have a patient that I'm quite sure um, the symptoms for him, because he was undiagnosed, turned into schizophrenia, obsessive compulsive disorder, and depression. And that was the result of undiagnosed Lyme in his situation. Uh, that's rare, fortunately, and it can also cause abnormal heart rhythms. So with this disease, again, I look at it from an inflammatory point of view. Uh, Late-stage Lyme, uh, is often misdiagnosed if you have been told uh, multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, lupus, Crohn's disease, HIV, uh, and any other autoimmune and neurodegenerative diseases, you do want to rule out Lyme disease. It's, uh, I know we have a, uh, an attendee here from the United Kingdom. Yes, it's, it's, it's there in England, Austria, all over Europe, every every country, uh, except I think Antarctica, where it's so cold where they don't have the ticks, um, it is possible. It says here in the slide a simple blood test can exclude Lyme. That's not true anymore. Uh, we know that in the first two weeks of the infection, yes, a Lyme titer can be positive. Uh, that's what we traditionally used to study or have, have a blood test done for patients, but they all come back negative because it's only positive in the first two weeks. It's very difficult to diagnose. It's kind of one of those great mimicker diseases which uh, we diagnose because it, this variety of symptoms are going on and it's outside this, this specific webinar to go into all of that. So our best thing is I know walking is very excellent for EDS patients. If you're out in the woods, uh, I highly recommend in the summers that you wear a hat because the ticks will drop from trees, long sleeve shirt like a white turtleneck, light colored pants with your socks tucked, uh, uh, tucked into socks or boots with your pants on that. Light colored clothing makes the tick more easily visible. And if you do have pets that are indoors and outdoors, make sure you check them for ticks before bringing them into the house. And make sure they have a tick and flea collar on them, extremely important. Another thing you can do to help protect yourself there is permethrin spray, uh, which only goes on your clothes, lasts through five washes. Uh, you can use the different deets, and also a natural approach is oil of lemon eucalyptus helps repel ticks as well. Uh, and then we we're talking about the ecology. Uh, the deer are taking over here in the suburban rural areas and in the small mammals uh, and rodents, which uh, carry the disease as well, are burgeoning because we don't have the normal, the bobcats and the foxes that used to take care of them. So treatment for Lyme, it's important to get it diagnosed very early. Antibiotics for adults, doxycycline. Uh, for children, uh, it's better to have uh, amoxicillin and 
up to 30 days of uh, antibiotics for this disease. Now, if you are on an antibiotic for whatever reason, uh, make sure you're taking a probiotic to allow the positive bacteria in our digestive systems to survive. A wonderful quote, I, I don't know if I read it in The Economist or not, but uh, it was recently that in one centimeter of our colon are more bacteria than people who have ever lived on our planet. So I like to say, who's really in charge? Obviously, the bacteria are. So this, again, gets back to a good a good diet. Um, probiotic could be um, having actual pills of the right bacteria uh, uh, that you can get at uh, good quality health food stores. You could uh, certainly have non-sweetened yogurt, kefirs. Those kinds of things help uh, with the positive uh, growth of uh, the good bacteria that we do need in our bodies. So, uh, kind of coming back to where we started, this is a, a wonderful diagram of the Mediterranean, Mediterranean approach to eating. So let, let's take a look at it, though, because we already have some variations that we want to look at within that and not necessarily follow this wonderful pyramid. So at the bottom, what does it say? Mediterranean approach to eating, and to our right, be physically active and enjoy. So obviously with the EDS, um, you have to work with the right activities. It's, I'm not an EDS specialist, but certainly walking is beneficial, a stationary bike um, that would be safe for you to do, swimming, uh, exercising within water. Those are areas that are good. They decrease inflammation, and uh, they increase our body's natural endorphins and enkephalins, which help with chronic pain. And then it's active and joy. So the concept of having a positive attitude where possible, um, focusing on the good things in life can be very helpful for inflammation. Then if we look at the basis of the foods, if we look at such fruits, vegetables, I would reverse those. I would say vegetables should be number one. Fruits, melon and berries, and avoid the juices and avoid the bananas and uh, fruits with very high sugar because they uh, create hyperglycemia, which creates more inflammation. Grains, uh, basically one serving a day if you must. They're, they're not the bread of life anymore. Uh, oil should be focusing on olive oils. Nuts should be primarily things like maybe cashews uh, because almonds and, and peanuts uh, are all uh, out of balance with our essential fatty acids. So if you're using almond milk, you may want to consider trying uh, uh, organic coconut milk instead. It's a better balance of the essential fatty acids. Soy products, as we know, also seem to be pro-inflammatory. Uh, the legumes, uh, all the beans, uh, beans and peas are, again, uh, more pro-inflammatory, so you're better off having a very colorful plate of the leafy vegetables and um, less beans. Herbs and spices. In terms of spices, anti-inflammatory, things like turmeric, curry, and especially ginger, if you're able to tolerate those, uh, are, are great anti-inflammatory spices. Um, warm ginger tea, uh, tea bags or grate your own, uh, is a wonderful way to incorporate anti-inflammatory herbs. Then we go up to the fish and seafood. The concern there, of course, is the source of them and making sure they're not from any polluted waters. And I would put in that second tier with the fish just lean protein of all sorts uh, with limited red meat. But poultry is good, eggs. Uh, and unless you um, have a sensitivity to uh, dairy products, uh, you know, limited cheese and, and yogurt can be good. Uh, if you're really sore and achy, what you may consider trying to do for a month is eliminate all grains and all dairy and see if, if that doesn't make a major change in your life. Very difficult to do. Also, uh, extra fat, adipose tissue, uh, creates inflammatory uh, responses in our body, let alone contributing to the potential for diabetes. Uh, on the left, I like it, a lot of good water and some wonderful wine and some nice studies on red wine. So this pretty much ends my, my talk, and I'm going to end with this slide. Hopefully you'll get a bit of a laugh out of it. Uh, please don't shoot the messenger. The, uh, uh, 
what I've presented tonight is some things that I've developed over about uh, 30 years of, of practicing and uh, listening and learning. We're, we're always changing and always learning new information about how our bodies work. By no means is this a definitive uh, webinar tonight. Uh, you, you know, please try to, to stay well informed, and I would like to thank the American Chiropractic Association for a number of uh, slides on chronic pain. Uh, some of the tick-borne disease, if you want a better reference for that. Good old Wikipedia, they're pretty wonderful. They uh, have a lot of information, but things are always evolving and changing, and uh, I hope you'll find that this was somewhat helpful tonight. Uh, I do see that we have uh, a lot of questions, so I will kind of okay. move to Go right up to the questions if you like. I, I think you've spread a lot of um, good, uh, good input on... Uh, people are really thinking about inflammation and about their their uh, diet habits and choices. So let's go ahead uh, to the Q&A box and see what we find. Uh, the first question is from Rebecca, and she asks, I have been on a feeding tube for two years. Will I ever be able to get off it? I don't know what your diet was like before. Uh, I am not an expert on uh, the feeding tube. Uh, I think you would need to talk with the doctors um, uh, that you're working with about that. Uh, if your diet was the high inflammation diet beforehand, um, then that may be related. Uh, she says an interesting topic, often suffer with it in joints and even at times, my head at times, but nothing really gets picked up in blood results. My ESR, which is a marker of inflammation levels, have been high, but there is no supposed link. I would uh, link to EDS and inflammation, as we were told by Stanmore Orthopedic Hospital in London, but I don't believe this to be true. Can you shed more light? London is very behind on the way EDSers are, suffer and are treated. Uh, that's also Sonia. So uh, hopefully tonight's information um, gives you a direction to go. I would also, in your blood work, not only look at, at the ESR sed rate, but I routinely do C-reactive proteins uh, as well as homocysteine levels. And again, you have some studies. You can do your vitamin D levels now and your essential fatty acids. Those would be areas that I would do some continued blood work to uh, see if that sheds any more light and I guess slight possibility of, of uh, Lyme disease. Uh, question, um, Sonia also asked, is olive oil and rapeseed oil good? Olive oil, definitely. And it seems that the long-chain fatty acids in, or medium-chain fatty acids in coconut oil are very helpful. Um, and so, yeah, olive oil, absolutely. We already looked at the other oils and see how they uh, are not a good balance for our essential fatty acids. Hi, if I heard it right, nuts have pro-inflammatory agents. Yes, peanuts do. Uh, are they a good protein snack? This is from Jerry. I didn't know it creates inflammation. Uh, yes, uh, peanuts do. Uh, almonds uh, are pro-inflammatory and out of balance. Cashews are uh, different. They're a tree nut, and um, they, they would probably be a better choice for you, Jerry. Uh, I know we need to get the wheat belly book. I'm interested in learning more about legumes, yum, and heirloom whole wheat, not GMO and their effects on the body. Can you talk about this a bit more? Yes, certainly if you're going to have wheat, uh, this is from Keith. Um, if you're going to have wheat, if you can, uh, that's great because I've been asking this question for a while. Are there heirloom wheats which are pre-1970s, which uh, that would certainly be a better choice, but unfortunately, yes, the legumes and the wheat are uh, pro-inflammatory. So it's interesting, people who say, oh, they're very proud to be vegetarians and their foundation is carbohydrates, the grains, um, the pastas. And they say, oh, it's great because I'm not eating meat. But in the same process on an inflammatory basis, uh, you are creating inflammation. So once again, where possible, try to have the vegetables in. Okay, how can you measure inflammation in the body? Well, there we go. Um, Inflammation in the body, uh, we gave you the markers, so erythrocyte sedimentation, right, C-reactive protein, homocysteine. Uh, those are our three interesting markers, uh, which if they're all elevated, uh, you could also do a, a rheumatoid arthritic profile, RA profile, 
Uh, and if those numbers are out of whack, your body is definitely in a pro-inflammatory state. Uh, learning to deal with stress is vital to our health, absolutely, Keith. Uh, any books or learning for resources? <laughs> Currently reading How to Stop Worried and Start Living by Dale Carnegie. He's, he's a wonderful resource. I, I think each of us needs to find what, what, what gives us peace. Uh, whether it be listening to music, playing piano, reading, a uh, walk in the woods, or, or whatever we do, um, trying to focus in our crazy world on some of those. Okay, a question from Rashan, how is Lyme disease tested? So uh, Lyme disease, as I mentioned, is a very difficult to disease. It's almost uh, you have to look at the whole plethora of symptoms. Uh, other things that are affected uh, with Lyme disease can be uh, you can do a thyroid profile, see if that's out of whack. Your uh, iron levels, serum ferritin in the blood quite often are very decreased. Uh, it, it, it's more just the, the whole uh, constellation of symptoms that you need to go to a Lyme literate doc, and they are far to find, hard to find, probably just like EDS docs. Uh, very few people are literate with this. Uh, and Daniel, I believe, asks, regarding diet, how does almond milk, natural fats such as goose fat, coconut oil, butter fare in terms of arachidonic acid? Okay. Uh, basically, as I said, I think um, coconut oil and uh, olive oil are your best go-to fats. The coconut oil is solid at room temperature. It is a medium-chain fat. It is a saturated fat. However, for sautéing, it's stable and good if you like the taste. If you don't, then uh, maybe stick with olive oil. Um, butter, in terms of a milk product, uh, does feed the arachidonic acid cascade, as do cheeses. Um, goose fat, not sure, um, but it's interesting. Apparently, things like lard are better for us. I cannot say for sure. Uh, but, uh, again, almond milk is an uh, imbalance of the correct essential fatty acids, so you'd better be... I'd be better off with a coconut milk. Uh, does butter convert into uh, arachidonic acid, Steve? That I don't know for sure. Uh, I know dairy products have a tendency to feed the arachidonic acid cascade. Um, on that, I maybe ask Siri. <laughs> uh, can you measure arachidonic acid levels in the body? Good question. Um, I imagine you could. I never thought of that before, but that would be a great idea. Um, I will look into that. Um, seems to be Lyme is a popular diagnosis all of a sudden, and most people are city dwellers, so where are they getting it? Uh, this is from Rashawn. Well, what we're finding is city, I think it's more suburban, but people do walk in the woods. They go travel. Uh, if they're camping, hiking, it's possible. It is overdiagnosed in some cases for sure. It's, it's the go-to disease now. Everybody says, oh, I've got this, I've got this, I must have Lyme disease. Absolutely not, but uh, it is, uh, uh, as I said, extremely difficult to diagnose. Uh, there's, there's no simple way to do it. It has to be a constellation of symptoms than we do. There are much more sensitive tests now for Lyme. A laboratory is doing that. I, Sorry, off the top of my mind, I, I, uh, I don't have that reference. Uh, let's see. Still there? Yes. Uh, I get summer flus a lot with all symptoms you mentioned, but not the facial. Should I speak to my doctor? I often get outbursts of anger also and impossible PTSD and bipolar from Sonia. Uh, yes, if, if these are new symptoms and you had exposure outdoors, uh, summer flu is, is you know, uh, if you get them a lot, your immune system could be down. So, uh, it's certainly possible that if these are kind of new symptoms, Sonia, that I would uh, recommend uh, having trying to find a Lyme literate doctor. Oh, I was bitten by a tick sometime around 86. I don't remember if I had the bull's eye on my leg or not. However, I definitely had the symptoms you described. Can the test for Lyme disease still be done even though it's been so long? K. Hey. Uh, sometimes it's positive in late stage Lyme. Uh, question from Kittery. Are you implying that those who have been diagnosed with EDS may actually have Lyme disease? No, not at all. Uh, EDS, from what we're understanding, is a congenital genetic disease that gets manifest as um, 
usually in the teens, sometimes much earlier. I'm just saying that if you have EDS, you also may have Lyme disease, uh, but uh, or actually not actually have Lyme disease. You can have both. Uh, Lyme does not cause EDS. EDS does not cause Lyme. But yes, of course, you could have both of those going on. Um, oxycodone and oxynorm, what are the long-term effects? I'm not a medical physician. Uh, from what I understand, however, uh, they are addictive opiates. If that is what you need to function and you are not an addictive personality, you will find a level that you can use and it will help you, uh, that will help you function, then that's certainly uh, an appropriate uh, drug for your use. If you're finding you need more and more and you have drug-seeking behaviors because of it, uh, that's something to consider. But again, with EDS and pain, uh, it might be a, a good choice of drug for you, Sonia. Again, I'm not a medical physician, so I cannot comment on drug usage. Please address the dangers of Avalox, Cipro, and Levaquin. That illness infection needs to be cultured to ensure with an antibiotic susceptibility test to be run, infection can be viral, bacterial, fungal, and parasitic, Rashan. Absolutely. Um, you can... Um, I assume by when you say that illness, you're referring to the Lyme disease. Uh, it, it's very difficult to culture uh, from blood to see if you have Lyme, but definitely uh, the overuse of antibiotics is, is not good. And uh, quite often if it's something viral, you don't want an antibiotic. Uh, what, what type of practitioner is best to see when seeking to rule out Lyme and how would they do that? The Lyme Disease Association of America has a good website, and they should have a listing of Lyme literate doctors. Uh, and here's an interesting comment. I'm finding that nutrition is a key to a lot of EDS management. I'm very sensitive to almost everything. Slow motility and enzyme deficiencies. I've found that low food map diet helps me absolutely, which is basically to avoid foods that ferment. I've also found that there is a histamine problem and take an enzyme called uh, diamine oxidase, which neutralizes gut histamine. Overgrowth of bacteria is a big problem because of slow motility, and that can be a source that gets into the abdomen and spine. Does this make sense to you? Absolutely, Ashley. Um, and slow motility, uh, you know, if you're able to increase vegetation, that should help with it. Um, also, diazepam, is there an alternative? I don't like taking oxynorm or oxycodone, but diazepam is very important as I have extreme muscle spasms. Uh, I'm sorry, Sonia, I cannot comment on that. Um, Dr. Bridgham, is there a particular type of supplements you uh, recommend? Are there particular ingredients to look out for, et cetera? Emily. The, um, the, all I can say is what I've used and I've found pretty good are Thorne Laboratory. They seem to have a good standard of care for supplementations. Um, I do use them in my office. I, uh, that's just uh, a, a, a generic thing. In general, the big box store things, oh, uh, internet, inexpensive ones, quality absorbability is not necessarily as good as the ones from a, a good laboratory. Also, rapid strep tests are not reliable as there is strep A through J, and rapid strep is only for A and B, therefore not receiving a correct diagnosis. Uh, yes, that happens too. Uh, by no means is medicine and laboratory medicine perfect. This is from uh, Anne Marie. My feet have nine end stage osteoarthritic joints for the orthopedic walking and standing are limited to 15 minutes. He strongly recommends aquatics. The problem is limited access to public pools and other classes. I'm having a hard time getting a script from a doctor for a swim spa. Without the script, my husband won't allow the purchase. What are your thoughts? Given your situation, yes, uh, uh, like an at-home swim spa could be very helpful for you. The, with the end-stage osteoarthritic joints, uh, again, go back to try, look at your diet from the past, see if it met some of those pro-inflammatory uh, focuses and see if you can change that. that that's a tough one. The end stage osteoarthritis, the deterioration of the joint is quite quite extreme. Water-based activities indeed are right, but if you have a 
trouble with transportation and access, that, that's going to be very difficult. Uh, I always seem to be more inflamed during season changes, especially when it gets cold. Is that just me or is there a connection there from Andrea? Well, there certainly could be a connection with sunlight exposure. When do we get colds and flus? When is our immune system down? The relationship to vitamin D could certainly be there, Andrea. I would recommend a vitamin D test. And as the seasons change and it gets cold, we get a lot less sunlight and we have a lot more clothes on, so we have a lot less sun exposure. Uh, where does coconut oil fit into all of the diet information? Well, as, as someone said, like Lyme disease is the uh, disease du jour. Uh, everybody seems to be having it. Coconut oil is the latest fat as well. I do use it myself, especially for sautéing foods. It's a stable oil. It doesn't go rancid. And uh, it's a medium-chain fatty acid, and it's supposed to be good for our brains. And then please explain the difference between food allergy and why food intolerance testing, NRT, is so important. My irritable bowel syndrome has completely changed since I did NRT testing and remove those foods, gluten, wheat, soy, corn, legumes, oats, dairy, and it saved my life. Uh, Rashawn again. Absolutely. Food allergy and food intolerance testing, if you don't have access to having that done, the first thing you can do is get rid of grains and dairy and see how you feel in a month. Then slowly add one of those back in. But in general, from tonight, hopefully you've learned that grains are pro-inflammatory, as is dairy. The uh, I, I do testing both with applied kinesiology muscle testing in my office. Uh, when exposing patients, they bring in a, a wide variety of all the foods they taste, and we can get some idea there. Also, there's blood testing that can be done where you can screen, but that's so three or four hundred dollars. Uh, thoughts on 23 and me testing? I'm not sure what that's all about. Uh, that's from Rashawn. Uh, NRT testing, uh, not again, not sure specifically what NRT, if it's using muscle testing. I am familiar, Rashawn, but uh, not that. Okay, we did some research on folic acid and how EDSERS might not be able to process it well. Apparently, H, BH4 enzyme can help to absorb it better. Apparently, excess folic acid causes joint pain. Just wondered what alternatives within your experience with diet to reduce folic intake, but to also keep lower arachidonic acid levels. Uh, I'm not familiar uh, specifically with BH4 enzymes and the relationship between EDS and folic acid, uh, so I'm sorry I can't really uh, answer that, and uh, so I can help you, Daniel. Uh, this is from Jerry, my daughter, seven, with EDS, hypermobile. She has early signs of scoliosis. Any recommendations? I eat sunflower and seed butter instead of peanut butter. Oh, okay. Well, oh, sorry, to Jerry. Uh, she has early signs of scoliosis. Probably related to the hypermobile EDS. I would say, where possible, strengthening the muscles around the spine. Now, uh, there is a program on the Internet, and I actually ran this by uh, D and she looked at it and said it's too intense for most EDSers. But what what she needs to do is work uh, muscles. So in, in general, when I don't know if you remember back in the beginning when I said uh, the three S's in posture: sit tall, stand tall, and stay tall. And that's a lot of extension in the spine. You can literally put a thumb under your bottom rib, your little finger on your hip bone and increase that space, find out what muscles are doing that, um, and begin to work those basic exercises. And I would say certainly work uh, with an occupational physical therapist who's aware of EDS. The, uh, if you can find a chiropractic physician who does applied kinesiology in your area, uh, you don't say where you're from, then they might be able to guide you a little bit, uh, but just certainly make sure that if you do have any chiropractic services that you let them know your daughter has EDS. Uh, from Deanna, I eat sunflower seed butter instead of peanut butter. That's better. Cashew might be the best. Uh, are sunflower and pumpkin seeds inflammatory? Well, we know sunflower oil is. Uh, pumpkin seed, I don't know. Uh, I, I think... Uh, 
pumpkin seed may be may be good. It's uh, but we know that the oil sunflower are pro inflammatory, and as I said, maybe cashew butter might be better. I use grapeseed oil, coconut oil, olive oil, and avocado oils. Are any of these better than others? Deanna, olive oil, from our understanding, is the best. Then coconut oil, at this point, is still good. There may be some studies coming out in the future where it isn't. Uh, that I can't know. So I would, in order of oils, uh, olive oil, coconut, avocado, and then grapeseed. Can you give any advice as far as chiropractic manipulation goes in EDS? Is it something that should be or shouldn't be done, or should certain techniques be avoided? Within chiropractic, uh, this is from Elizabeth, within chiropractic there are uh, many different approaches to manipulative therapy. It would depend upon the level of expression of EDS in your own specific body. The, I, I actually have limited experience with EDS patients, the, you know, you need to communicate that. They need to be EDS literate and know that a high velocity thrust would be contraindicated areas. And you're generally dealing with obviously the hypermobility. Chiropractic in general, we deal with the hypomobility uh, where the motions are decreased. It's not absolutely contraindicated, but it's something I would proceed cautiously with. Okay, this is from Rashawn again, gastric bypass patient as well as CVID patient going to see a genetics doctor, so malabsorption an issue and low iron levels, took iron and levels went, went down. Um, there are a number of comorbidities that we say, Rashawn, that you have that I really can't um, give you a lot of information. Sorry, I can't be helpful there. Uh, Dr. Bridgham, I had a Western blot test for Lyme disease. My results were negative. Is that a good one for detecting it. Uh, this is from Emily. Only in the first two weeks of exposure to the bacteria is it positive. It's a very generic test. There are much more sensitive tests coming out. The Let me just see if I can find that reference for you for the lab. Um, pardon for the delay here, everybody. But let me see, and I'll go on to the next question as I'm looking or this lab information, but okay. The lab uh, that could be helpful is IGENX, the capital letter I, G E N E X Incorporated. Let me see if I can give you a reference to them. Uh, they're in Palo Alto, California. Uh, IGENX Incorporated. Palo Alto, California, and the telephone number is 800-832-3200. Once again, their number is 800-832-3200. They have a much broader base of testing than just the Western blot. I hope that helps, Emily. How is... How, this is from Sonia. How to treat the feeling of pressure and inflammation in the head? Uh, don't know what's causing it. Uh, again, maybe some of the blood work just to look at overall inflammation. It's lightly possible uh, if you had exposure to uh, ticks that it might be related there, but many other causes. It's with the ADS and the connective tissue issues, it may be more related to an EDS. Uh, and I do not, unfortunately, know uh, medical EDS doctors in in uh, Houston. And then I know being outside would be preferable, but can you get vitamin D through a very sunny window, Donna? Yes, absolutely. Put a bathing suit on and give yourself 20 minutes a day, not initially, but in the sun. Uh, it's maybe more difficult. Hopefully you would be able to lie so you could get some on your back as well as your stomach, but that, that's a nice way to get vitamin D. Then this is from Daniel. In terms of spinal, would inversion tables help me with the sit tall, stand tall, et cetera? Not really. Uh, the purpose of the sit tall, stand tall, and stay tall, Daniel, is to use the muscles that you have to do that versus if you're on an inversion table, you're just letting gravity do it. So it's really more working the muscles you start 
uh, with just maybe 30 seconds or a minute. You can do it if you're riding in a car. Uh, it's a time when I practice it and just kind of try to be aware of it and incorporate it into your everyday living. Okay. Any advice on 23 and ME genetic testing? That I have nothing. Could I talk more about scoliosis, please, Ashley Smith? It's called idiopathic scoliosis, and idiopathic means people don't know why people get it. Uh, the uh, idiopathic scoliosis means, uh, oh, I guess I should have typed all this out. I'm sorry. I didn't, this is my first webinar here. Um, but the scoliosis patients that I have, I work with them through a lot of muscle testing, try to find aberrant nociceptor input coming in literally from the toes on up. And a good chiropractic physician, especially who has a specialty in what we call applied kinesiology or muscle testing, can guide you. Uh, that would be my, my best choice. I think on the slide that I have, I have my email there. I can try to, you know, within reason, answer questions. If people have some uh, more specific things, feel free to email me. So thank you all very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bridgem. We appreciate all of your expertise and, and um, knowledge about um, these issues. And really, everybody that's been um, here at the live um, webinar has been very engaged in, in talking about the, uh, the content that you've presented, and, and it looks like they're looking forward to um, looking more at their diets and um, different issues that could affect the inflammation that's in their bodies. So yeah, I mean, we're it's, glad it's that, that interesting chicken and egg. Um, does EDS create inflammation? Uh, does infl underlying inflammation impact the expression of EDS? And I would say probably, you know, the answer is most likely both. So if we can put the house that's on fire out and then let the body try to deal with uh, one thing at a time versus our overall inflammation, I think that's a good direction. So thank you very much, all. Thank you. We appreciate it. And uh, we wanted to remind everyone that uh, next webinar will be on December 1st, and we're going to have an uh, occupational therapist talking about manual therapy for EDS. So um, be sure to uh, join us then for that uh, meeting. And uh, we're going to uh, wrap up for the evening. And, again, thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Bridgem, and all those that – attended this evening. We got a lot of good information, a variety of information about nutrition and chiropractic treatment, and it's very uh, very informative for, for all of our members. So I wanted to remind you again that our sponsor this evening is Body Support Store, uh, where you'll find over 250 products that are selected by EDSers for EDSers. That makes this program free. So please go out and check out uh, the friendly products that we have uh, on our store. So, again, uh, thank you all for attending, and we'll call it an evening. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night.